Well, welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mayberry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You're here for Leading Through Chaos, Surviving and Thriving in Turbulent Times. And Fred Rykowski is with us. He's uh, with Vegas, excuse me, Legacy Business Leaders, LLC, based in Canton, Ohio. And Fred, um, we're ready, but I just want to say a shout out to Hedick for generously sponsoring all of our webinars this month. Fred, we're set to go. Thank you so very much. Fred, one moment, please. We have to unmute your line. Excuse me, folks, sorry about that. Okay, Fred, we're ready to rock, thank you. All right, thank you, Debbie, and thank you, NKB, as always, for a great opportunity. And greetings to all of you, welcome. I hope everyone's off to a great start this new year. And welcome to Leading Through Chaos, Surviving and Thriving in Turbulent Times. And who would have known a year ago, uh, having gone through what we did in the recent months and weeks, that this title would be so appropriate at this point in time. But when you think about it, that's the nature of our industry, right? It's an industry of unknowns, it's an industry of variables, and every day is a new adventure. And if you have been around for any length of time, know that and experience it day in and day out. There's just stuff that we can't control. And today we're gonna to look at that whole idea of how to really take back full ownership of your business in a way that's tangible for you, that you can take away value and put it to work for you today and find that at the end of the year, you're gonna have different results because everything you do starting today, every decision you make is gonna to contribute to those results. The main value you have, the takeaway that I want you to take from this webinar today is that it's how you look at those things and, and consequently how you make decisions every single day. Regardless of what you're going through though, now or in the future, it's a pretty level playing field. When you think about it, every kitchen and bath business across the country faces pretty much the same kind of variables, even though we can't predict what they are. And in all honesty, there's just a lot of stuff we can't control. We can survive and we can thrive. So whether it's political unrest, COVID or COVID-2, lumber tariffs, tariffs uh, labor shortages, forest fires, hurricanes, material shortages, financial market uncertainty. All of us are gonna be going through that pretty much together. We can't control it. But there's one thing, a corollary that's real important to remember. This world around us really doesn't care about us all that much. In fact, the world does not exist to serve our best interest. It never has and it never will. So where do we go with that? Well, Stephen Covey in his great book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, really puts it in perspective when he says this, it's inspiring to realize that in choosing our response to circumstance, we powerfully affect our circumstance. And basically what he's saying is we can implement our own future right now. It's up to us to take responsibility for our future success, regardless of what's going on around us. Because as I said, every day is gonna be a new adventure. In fact, in my business life, uh, it was clear to me many times that the stuff that happened to me in our business was some days just absolutely indescribable. And I heard a story like that even this morning from someone that was just absolutely unthinkable. But it happens and it's up to us to decide how we're going to respond to that kind of stuff versus react. We can implement the future now, we can do that. But listen leaders, it's up to you. It's up to what you do now because every decision you make today will impact your future results, end of this year and into the future. The key to success is expect to win. I have that post-it note on the wall of my home office. It's been there for years. In fact, it says expect to win, possess an emotional climate of high expectations. How about you? Do you get up in the morning, every morning, expecting to win? Or do you just assume that you win? Or worse yet, do you just simply hope that things will okay, be okay? I don't think any of us gets up in the morning with the goal of being mediocre, right? Uh, so it's up to us. We have to go into our days fully expecting to win. 
after all, consider that you started a business for a reason, right? You started a business because you wanted to do two things, create a great profit and have peace of mind that comes from it. How many of you are accomplishing that day in and day out amidst all the chaos that's going on around you, the distractions, the diversions, the demands that are on you every single day? Well, a lot of those issues, depending on how you are thriving or not so much thriving in them is up to you. It's up to us to expect to win. Nobody starts a business with the expectation that it's going to end up in perpetual adolescence. Nobody does that. But your business is uh, naturally and organically inclined to grow. And that's a fact of life. Every business is. It wants to grow. But the glass ceiling in every single business is leadership. It's us. We determine whether or not that business can and will grow. And sometimes we try to force growth and outrun our resources and end up in a lot of trouble. Growth is not a function though, and this is important, of how busy we are or how hard we work. Yes, hard work does count for something, but that's not what's most important. The ability and willingness to adapt three disciplines that we're gonna talk about today and putting them into practice more importantly is what's gonna determine your future ability to grow, your business ability to grow and prosper and thrive in spite of what's going on around you. The three things are vision, daring, and decisiveness. Three key leadership attributes. And I'm gonna show you how those work in real life, real time, every single day so that you can put them into work and literally cascade those principles throughout your organization. Every single position, every single day, focused on what's most important. But when any of those three, three things is missing, growth stalls. And it's amazing to me, and I've seen this happen many, many times, that over time, the better we prepare for the unknown, the more emotionally prepared we are to accept those things that are going to happen. They'll be uncomfortable. They'll take us out of our comfort zone. They'll put a lot of tension on us. But the better prepared we are, the fewer, the, more, the less frequent those things happen. It's just a fact of life. The moral of the story, be prepared. Chaos shows up. We don't thrive, and this is important, we don't thrive in, or, or we don't thrive on chaos, but we thrive in chaos, at least we can. And here's another corollary. When you're striving for excellence, chaos shows up. When we start upsetting the status quo in and around us, in our business and, and everything that, that touches our business, chaos shows up. And it's up to us to be prepared in order to be emotionally ready to respond to it in a positive way. Well, let's talk about growth. What exactly is business growth? Most of us define growth as a result of how many sales we have, how much profit we're making, how much revenue we're producing over time. Those things are good, of course, but they're all just symptoms of good and healthy growth. What growth is really defined by is two things. Number one, it's your organization's ability to solve more and more complex problems. That's called maturity or emotional intelligence. It's your organization, it's cascading through everyone, every position, the ability to solve more and more complex problems. And secondly, to overcome adversity. That's what growth is. And that's how exactly an organization leads through chaos. So let's take a look at the three disciplines, keyword today, discipline. That's what this is all about. Discipline is a practice, something you do over and over to get better and better and produce better results over time. That's all a discipline is. We're going to look at these three things. Number one, being on purpose versus being busy. Busyness is an epidemic in our industry. I know it. I lived it. And if you're not careful, busyness will draw you into the ground level fray. I call it ground zero, where we just can't see the forest for the trees. We allow all the demands, all the diversions, as I mentioned earlier, to surround us and embrace us and engulf us. But being on purpose is the equivalent of being decisive one of the three leadership principles. Number two, we're gonna look at how to focus on customer experience. I call it CX for short. That's vision and it really has impact. Uh, the vision to be able to see the importance of customer experience and more importantly, how to put it into practice, how to make it the focus of what we do every single day will change the game for you and your people. And as, as a result, it will produce better outcomes uh, in the short term and in the long term both revenue and profitability. Number three, learning discipline today, 
is going to be managing constraints versus managing tasks. Now, I'm going to explain more about that, but it's a huge paradigm shift. And most of us are really, really accustomed and conditioned to manage tasks, whether you realize it or not. I want to make that contrast for you today and help you see how important it is to be managing constraints versus tasks. That's the daring part. It takes guts to step out and upset the status quo, but do so we must. Listen, leaders, if you're going to have a different year, the end of this year, it's not going to be because, be because you've done the same thing over and over and expected different results, like Einstein said. It's not it. It's going to be a matter of these three disciplines and how you implement them into your business every single day. I want to start out with a story, though, to illustrate this, these, these three disciplines primarily. It's out of a book by Jim Collins uh, called Great by Choice. And what Jim Collins did to, to illustrate this beautifully, by the way, was that he was decided to research companies that perform spectacularly, now listen carefully, in unstable environments characterized by forces out of their control and potentially harmful. Sound familiar to anybody? Unstable environments, forces out of their control, potentially harmful. Well, I know most of you, if not all of you, can look around you right now today and are probably even in the midst of a fray of some sort or another that involves one or more of these issues. And so what he did was he started out by researching with 24,000 companies and he performed seven, or excuse me, 11 cuts. He had certain metrics in place by which he measured whether or not these companies did perform, quote unquote, spectacularly or not. Through 11 cuts, he got this down to seven companies out of 24,000 that beat industry standards by 10 times, seven companies. They did it. In spite of all the chaos, in, sp in spite of all the turbulence, these seven companies did it. And to, do, to illustrate the leadership uh, principles that came into play with these seven companies, he tells a story, and I'm going to share it briefly with you, but it really does nail down exactly what these three disciplines do when you put them into practice. To do so, he talked about the, a 1911 event. This was a race to the South Pole between two guys and their teams, Robert Scott and Roland Amundsen. Two guys about the same age, about the same size teams. Both of them agreed to go on this 1400 mile round trip to the South Pole on foot. 20, minus 20 degree temperatures with gale force winds, 1,400 miles. Here's what happened. One of them, Roald Oppenson, got to the South Pole first. In fact, he reached the pole 34 days before Scott did. Roald Oppenson and his team turned around, came back, and made it safely back to the start, the winners. Scott, to his credit, did make it 34 days later. However, the sad news is that on the return trip, Scott and his entire team perished. So what's the difference between these two teams? And I want to I want you to listen carefully because when you when you understand the principles that are illustrated in the story, it will it will have huge impact on how you do business going forward. The difference wasn't that one of the leaders was necessarily more charismatic or ambitious or lucky. Not at all. But here's what the difference did, uh, is. Um, Collins, the author, uh, came to title these seven companies as 10Xers. That's what he called them because of the 10 times uh, market uh, results. He said the 10Xers, how did they distinguish themselves? Well, they did so by embracing a paradox of control and non-control. And this is exactly what happened in the trip to the South Pole. Amundsen, Came noted, came, uh, became famous for what was called his 20 mile march strategy. And all that was was simply the discipline which he found out early in the trek to hold his team to 20 mile maximum marches every day, regardless of good weather or bad weather. He kept them there because he knew that his limited resources couldn't go any farther. If he stretched them too far, that the, the team would be much more susceptible to all the adverse conditions, all the chaos going on around them. By contrast, when the weather was good and the conditions were favorable, he held back. He knew that he needed to conserve those resources and use them wisely. They were finite resources. Scott, by contrast, took a, a, a 
wild leap towards the South Pole. On, on the good days, he went all out all day long and marched and marched till his people were exhausted. On the bad days, then they hunkered down and they didn't have the energy to really resist all these uh, chaotic conditions around them and really thrive through them. They didn't have it. It was gone. They, they, they used up, they outran their, their resources. Long story short, uh, how did they do it? Well, these seven companies were very similar. They embraced the paradox of control and non-control. On one hand, there are certain things that they face, continuous uncertainty, things they couldn't control. They know it, you know it, you have the same things. And on the other hand, they'll reject the idea that forces outside of their control or chance events will determine their results. They took full ownership of their future success. And that's what Amundsen did. He took full ownership of his success, the good and the bad, weighing his resources, conserving when he needed to, being ready to go when he had favorable conditions, but being measured in the way he took steps towards his goal, toward his ultimate outcome. These 10 extra companies, these seven companies were results oriented versus task oriented. Uh, one of their core behaviors that, that um, Jim Collins found out in his research was what he calls fanatic discipline. You hear that word? Fanatic discipline. They have the discipline. They all led their teams with a surprising method of self-control in an out of control world. I hope you're hearing that. And it was what, uh, as I said, Amundsen became famous for his 20 mile march strategy, having a clear, concrete, intelligent and rigorously pursued a performance mechanism that kept them on track. And yet the discipline to do so created and does create for you too, two self-imposed kinds of discomfort. One is the discomfort of unwavering commitment to high performance in difficult times. Expect to win. Everybody hear that, please. It was the discomfort of unwavering commitment to high performance in difficult times. And number two, the discomfort of holding back in good conditions, conserving your finite resources and using them wisely. And I don't think any metaphor more accurately describes what we go through in our industries. We're products of our decisions, not victims of circumstances. And you have two choices, as one author says, this year, you have two choices. You can either uh, choose the pain of discipline, or you'll experience the pain of regret. Your choice, your choice entirely. So let's go back and uh, get back to the beginning here a little bit. Sorry. Um, so let's take a look at this. Uh, we're going to jump into discipline number one and uh, have a look at what that really means. Discipline number one is purpose. And Gary, uh, excuse me, uh, Gary uh, Keller, uh, who wrote a great book uh, called The One Thing, talks about it this way. He says, uh, purpose is the ultimate source of personal strength. Being on purpose is to be decisive, but it gives us a source of strength. Eh, sorry, we'll keep the... Uh... There we go, Ricardo. So the ultimate source of personal strength. So what does that mean? It means that com clear, compelling purpose should always point us toward the marketplace. Um, that's what decisiveness means. It means being clear on why we do what we do and making sure everybody in our organization is likewise very clear on what we're doing and why we're doing it. It means not letting your business happen to you. It's meaning creating our own future. In Forbes magazine in 2018, a great article that pointed out the importance of this. And in their research, they noticed that uh, about fewer actually than 20% of leaders said that their goals were always clearly written down. And by contrast, those 20% of leaders produced 120 to 140% more great results, more likely to accomplish they're great results. And goals, I want you to know, goals are not wishes. Goals are measurable. They involve not only your business goals and all the stakeholders that go with that business, employees, staff, vendors, subs, all, everybody. What are the goals? 
everybody together for the greater good of the organization. And how about you personally? That can't be overlooked. It's always a key part of everything you should be going, pointing your business toward. But it's not about what you should do. Goals are about what you want. Set them up, make them clear. And really, when you think about it, goals really relieve stress and increase confidence. Uh, they foster good decision-making. Dale Carnegie said at one point, and I love this quote, he said that a person that starts out going nowhere usually gets there. And I think all of us can agree that's a very true principle and it works because profit and success are not random. They're not accidental ever. Discipline is a developmental path to get there, but it needs to be measured. Set your goals up for 2021 and measure them. If you don't have one, I wanna share a KPI dashboard with you. Uh, by the way, last point there on the pur uh, Purpose Drives Priority screen is competitive advantage. I wanna mention that too, and I'm going to unpack that shortly, but competitive advantage is a direct function of customer experience. That is being focused on the marketplace, or excuse me, as being purposeful. So let's take a look at uh, the KPI dashboard. And I'm happy to share any of these resources with you. Uh, if you would like or don't have one of these spreadsheets, you're welcome to it. Just let me know. And anything else I mentioned in the webinar today as well. Uh, the KPI is your key performance indicator measurement tool. Uh, it is a spreadsheet that's simple on which you document those things by which you want to measure your goals. And there's a few of them on the screen here. These aren't necessarily the ones that will be important to you. Some of them are for sure, uh, but there are others. Uh, typically companies have anywhere from uh, half a dozen to 12 or 15 KPIs, key performance indicators. But when you set up a dashboard like this, it becomes extremely compelling and takes a lot of stress off you and your team knowing where we are. Uh, are we on the way? Are, are, it's like a dashboard on a ship or a plane. Are we going the right direction? Are we getting there on time? Are we going off course? How do we need to course correct? This thing is gold and it's simple. It doesn't take much to do it. Set the goal. Notice in the column, the third column, there's a column there for goals. Put down your goals, measure them and move forward. But you won't get anywhere if you're not purposeful about setting the goals and following them. Um, goals are basically disciplines by which you suspend assumptions. I'll say that again. Goals are basically disciplines by which you suspend or do away with assumptions. And assumptions don't cut it. We cannot assume that this is going to be a good year just because the economy is holding up and the marketplace looks good. Those are all great things, but that certainly doesn't equate to success. Measure it, set the goals up, and be disciplined. And by doing so, we can do away with any kind of assumptions that lead us toward a mindset of mediocrity. Here's what I mean by that. Occasionally I hear this uh, sentence, we're doing the best we can with what we have. And honestly, that's nothing more than a statement of mediocrity. It's a statement of resignation. We can't do any better. There's just too many things that we can't control. And the reality of it is we have much more, you have much more impact and influence than you may think you do, regardless of what's going on around you in the economy or elsewhere. Excellence is not an event and it's not an arrival. It's just a long practice and continued practice of discipline. So let me share with you three purposeful behaviors that you can start now. Number one is learn how to be responsive versus reactive. There's a big difference. Uh, reactive is how most of us are condi conditioned to, to uh, behave uh, during uh, uh, stressful times. Uh, most of us react, and that's an emotional issue. But responsive means being taken, able to take control of our emotions and being able to stop and think about what is the best course of action right now based on this particular circumstance. Responsive versus reactive. It's a discipline. It's one that helps keep us on purpose. The second one is systems orientation. That means that you are systemizing your business. And by that, I mean that you have documented, trained systems, step-by-step step for each key function in your business so that everybody that's involved or responsible 
to be using that system, knows what it is, knows how to do it, and is practicing it regularly. That takes discipline on the leader's part. But systems are fairly simplistic if you know how to put them into play. Create them, train them, and hold people accountable to, do, to use them. Systems orientation. The number third one, or the number three one, is an outward mindset. Uh, that's very similar to number one, a little bit of difference though, in that most of us, again, are conditioned to think mostly about ourselves. And as a result, we have the tendency to really feel as though so many things are out of control that we just can't possibly succeed in any certain area of our business. And that's not true. An outward mindset really flips that whole paradigm upside down. And an outward mindset, for example, is one where we, we instead of trying to be, for example, interesting, that we now practice being interested. There's a big difference. It has huge impact in what we do, especially in the sales process. But throughout your whole organization, just learning how to listen, how to be quiet, how to stop and think about what other people are going through. This is the key leadership attribute of empathy and outward mindset. But these are all three disciplines. And that means they all take practice and they all take time. It's a discipline that leads us to be decisive in what we do. So let's go to number two. Um, what I wanna look at now is discipline two, which is marketplace focus. And this is a focus on customer experience, CX. So I wanna illustrate this by looking at this uh, assumption number one that we make on the bottom wheel there. And that is that when we start setting up a job, start working with a new client, we assume we're going to make profit. We try to set things up, we put things in play. We have people on board, sure, we have our finances. Yeah, those are okay. Yeah, we'll figure that out. Uh, our organizational structure, uh, yeah, we're, we're fine, we're good. Uh, these are assumptions that we tend to make. Yep, we're leading, okay, and sure, on purpose, well, I don't know, but we're good. We seem, we seem to know what we're doing and why we're doing it, uh, but none of those cut it because the other, the second assumption that comes in behind it then is that after we do all that stuff, that we're gonna have a great customer experience. And those are, nothing could be further from the truth if we're assuming all the stuff that's on the screen. We will end up lacking focus and being dysfunctional in how we try or attempt to be delivering customer experience and great profitability. By contrast, let's put these wheels all together. Let's interlink them. Uh, this is very similar to what your business is like. It's, it's a series of functions that have to work well together. And here's what I want you to hear on this. Your focus should first and foremost be on customer experience. If you're not delivering it or you can't deliver it, you can't succeed. At the end, you can't end up making great profit. But when everything's hooked together like this, here's what it looks like. It works well in harmony and you produce integrated control via customer focused and profit driven behaviors. Customer focused, profit driven behaviors. Get this right. Purpose, leadership, finance, organization, people, they all have to be in place firmly, clearly in place. You have to understand them. You have to own them. We don't have time to go into those today, but let me know if you want any information. I'll send it to you. Make sure you understand that each of these things, how each of these things fits together to make sure that you can deliver the ultimate goal that your business must have. It's a mandate, right? It's got to be profitable, but you have to start with a focus on CX. Now, question for you. If I went around and interviewed your staff today and asked them this question, what's your main focus on your job every single day? What would they say? I'm just curious. Uh, it's a rhetorical question, but it's one that you need to ask yourselves, I think. It's so important to understand that everybody is pointing their limited resources, their finite time, energy, and so forth into that same exact focus across the whole landscape of your business. Every single person, whether you're a two-person organization or a 200, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that everybody needs to be pointed in the same direction at the same time, every single day. When you think about it, uh, the market determines our success. They do. They're the only ones that can determine if we're succeeding or not. You can't do that without happy customers. Satisfied customers are a mandate for profitability, period. There's no refuting that principle. 
Satisfied customers are a mandate for profitability. Where's your focus? John Mackey, some of you may be familiar with, one of the co-founders of Whole Foods, which has since been bought by Amazon for ma major money, uh, said it this way. You're in business to satisfy customers. If you can't, you'll fail. You're in business to satisfy customers. If you can't, you'll fail. Let me unpack that. First thing he said was, you're in business. Remember, in your business, that means if you're in business, if you're an owner or, or a top leader in a business, your mandate is to be profitable. Number one, that's your number one responsibility across the board, day in and day out, protect your profit, number one. Number two, by the way, is develop your people. They're very closely linked. But without profit, forget about developing people. You can't. In other words, you can't grow your organization. You've got a glass ceiling in place. He said, number one, you're in business. That means you have to be profitable. Number two, if you can't satisfy customers, you'll fail. That means your focus has to be on the customer experience. Now, please don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that the customer is always right or they should be walking all over you like a doormat. That's nothing close to what I'm saying here. The fact is focus, focus on unique customer experience serve them well, but at the same time, defend your profit, not your prices. And if you do that well, you'll end up with a winning formula. You've got two choices, basically. You can either develop competitive advantages, which all of you have. Chances are you haven't really leveraged them or deployed them in the marketplace yet, or at least not all of them. Or as many of you experience day in, day out, you can become considered a commodity. And most of the buying public today really considers our industry to be a commodity. Well, I'm gonna get 10 prices. You know, everybody delivers the same exact thing as would be implicit in that comment. They all do the same stuff. You guys all do it. I'm gonna get 10 prices. Therefore, the cheapest price is gonna be the best one. That's definitely an assumption in our marketplace. We're a consumer mindset in our country. But the fact is you cannot allow yourself to be a commodity or to be considered a commodity. You have to develop some kind of advantage that sets you apart from the competition. Have to. Otherwise, it's just going to be the lowest price gets the job, and that's never a winning equation. Tiffany Bova wrote a great book called Growth IQ. Here's her quote. The true source of customer differentiation in the 21st century is customer experience. That's a major statement, major statement. And others, many others have observed the same exact thing. It's not what you do so much as it is how you do it. How do you deliver excellence? Is it noteworthy? Are your customers raving about you? Listen, the customers are only ones in the end of the day that get to make that decision. That's it. So you've got to make sure that you're delivering on what you say and more so that you can then focus on value and not price. And that's key to success. Value is delivering superior service in exchange for superior profit. And when you set yourself apart in the marketplace, when you make it clear, there's a, a clear and compelling difference between you and the competition. Listen, it could be the most subtle type of thing. It doesn't really matter how you answer the phone how quickly you respond to customer concerns, how you treat their home when you're in and around it, how your people, more importantly, treat their home, how people go the extra mile, how we go above and beyond, how we under promise and over deliver consistently that people know that along the way, we're gonna be the key person, the key company that they want to come back to. I can't tell you how many times in my career in remodeling kitchen, bath, and so forth, that I had clients come back to me toward the end of a job and say something like, you know, Fred, listen, uh, did you know you were the highest price we got of anybody? And, and I took that as a compliment. It was a huge compliment, as a matter of fact, because what, what they were saying to me was, we saw some kind of value that you delivered that nobody else did. That was a competitive advantage for us. It was huge. It allowed us to get the price we knew we had to get in order to succeed and thrive in the middle of all the chaos, it works. Competitive advantage is either something uh, others either cannot do or will not do over and over again. It's basically what it is. The combination of unique, this is conscious and well-planned activities designed to deliver superior service 
in exchange for superior profit. What are yours? Have you really articulated them clearly? You can either leverage current competitive advantages. How many reward, uh, excuse me, how many awards have you won? Are you clear about that and why you've won them? Are you clear about some of your unique time-tested proven systems and processes that set you apart? How about your unique proven warranty process? Customers love that. It's really important to them to know that that piece is in place, that after you walk away with the final check, that you have a proven process to take care of them, to make sure that they're getting the service they want and deserve. It's huge. It makes all the difference in the world. Talk about it. Be explicit about it. One company, RCC uh, Construction, I believe it was called, uh, a larger commercial company, but nonetheless serves well to illustrate the point, ran into some really tough times, uh, some really turbulent times when one of the co-owners passed away unexpectedly. This at the time was about a $34 million company. And what happened was uh, the co-owner, that was the owner's wife in this case, took over. Uh, over time, she realized that the current management wasn't going to cut it. She steps in and takes over this company, this large company. And they realized at the time that sales were suffering, that their, their, their marketplace brand uh, did not have the clout that it once had. They sat down together as a team. They began to look at the idea of what, what is different about us, if anything. They came up with a big, long list of things like a unique and high-profile customer list, uh, how many years in business, total years of experience for all of our people, and on and on. They had a big list, but the question became, does any of that really matter to anybody? So with a consultant's help, they did the one thing they must, they had to do, and that you have to do too, if you want to find out whether you have a real customer experience focus. They did customer research. And what they did was an anonymous survey uh, doing customer research and asked that question, what's most important to you with these types of jobs? And interestingly enough, when the results came back, all the big long list that the staff had made together describing what was great about the company, the most important thing wasn't even on there. They found out through the unique and the only resource they could tap to really know the truth that the one thing that the buying public wanted most was a great closeout and on-time process. They wanted in that building when they wanted in it and they wanted it completed with no punch list. And so over the next months and years, that company went to work. They dug down and they did every resource they had was focused toward that one constraint, that one issue of getting jobs done on time with excellence very little, if any, punch list. They put all their resources to, to overcome and, and, and um, uh, go get above that one hurdle that might have been stopping them. And here's what happened. In two years' time, two years, 24 months, listen carefully, this company went from 34 million to 68 million, doubled their revenue in two years. Why? Because they decided that a customer experience focus was the one single thing that mattered to their buying public and they made the change accordingly. That's vision. And that actually is exactly what this is talking about. A customer focus is vision. How is yours? Have you asked your customer? Have you asked the hard question? How are we doing? Sometimes we hate to ask it, but we have to if we really wanna know the truth and we really wanna have a business that's succeeding and growing and that's absolutely differentiated from our competition. Customer experience. Ask your people. Find out, are they focused? Are all of your resources focused? All right, let's go into discipline number three, and that is managing constraints, a constraints mindset versus managing tasks. And this is a big paradigm shift, as I said earlier. It's the daring part of leadership. Uh, it means we have to step out and really start looking hard at what we do. And I want you to think about this with me. What, what does managing constraints look like? Well, think about your business like a chain. Each link on the chain is a function, a critical function for you to be able to take that lead when it comes in, the very first link, and move it through the process consistently and as rapidly and efficiently as you can. 
all the way through to completion. Every link in the chain has to be interconnected and they are, but every company has a weak or some weak links, but every company has one weakest link. And that is your biggest constraint. And I say that with all confidence because I know that there's no perfect company out there. We all have a weakest link. What's yours? Think about it right now. Where is your weakest link? The idea is in that chain illustration is to take that lead and move it efficiently through the process up to a contract and then take that contract, that sale, and convert it into throughput. Throughput being gross profit and net profit. Revenue is nice, but it doesn't mean anything if you're not profitable. The mindset here is watch for constraints, manage constraints, and convert your sales into throughput as rapidly and efficiently as you can. That's what happens when you start looking at your business in such a way. Where's the weak link? Because it's what's stopping you. Basically, a constraint is the weakest link in the value chain. And here's your value chain. Let's look at it real quick and illustrate it. Your value chain is consists of these things. Number one is going to be your marketing machine. How are you doing? Foot on the pedal? You're keeping it up even though you're busy with sales right now. I know you are. That's a good thing. But you can't let your foot off the marketing pedal. You've got to stay visible. How about number two? Your sales design process. I hear more companies in our industry and across the entire construction industry get hung up in this part of their value chain. Sales design, oh, the customer making so many changes, they won't make decisions, we can't get selections, et cetera. Figure it out, maybe that's your weakest link. Let's look at number three here. Your pre-construction process, it's huge. It's how you assemble all the job details and information and data into a nice neatly wrapped package for your production team to go out and nail it and kill it without having a lot of bumbling around and getting out of each other's way. The next one, your production. How are you doing there? That's part of your value chain. Where's your constraints? Do you have any? Most companies do. Uh, a lot of times constraints are just your, um, uh, simply your, uh, a resource that needs to be managed better. And finally, how about the post construction? Equally as important as any of these other parts of your value chain. Why? You probably guessed to drive referrals back into the machine, self-sustaining business, post-construction. That's your value chain. Where's the weakest link for you? First, do that. Secondly, think about this. A constraint is anything that limits or jeopardizes improvement, anything. What is it for you? Third thing, it's usually and often the resource with the least capacity or the highest demand. That's all a constraint is. It's pretty simple, but there they are. What are yours? Now, let me just illustrate this. There's two main principles involved here uh, that determine your overall performance when it comes to a constraints mindset. Number one, and it sounds simplistic, it is, but think about it. Find the root issue. The root issues are where the constraints really lie. Uh, the danger here is that frequently, we end up trying to treat symptoms rather than treating root issues for a lot of different reasons we don't have time to go into. But the fact of the matter is, if you don't find the root issue, then you're just going to probably go around on a hamster wheel, re recycling old problems over and over again. Find the root issue. The second way, the second main issue that will help determine your overall performance this year is going to be managing them. Once you find the main weakest link, the biggest constraint, apply resources to it. Uh, local improvements, by the way, those at the ground level where most of us are tempted to improve, you know, this little thing or that little thing, think about it. A lot of times those things don't really have the impact on the global level in terms of driving throughput through your system. Think big. The global thinking is where leaders reside. They live there. Maybe not all the time. We've got a lot of stuff on our plate. That doesn't matter. We've got to be able to function at the global level in order to get local results. Um, focus on finite resources. That's what global thinkers do. We have X number of resources, uh, just like the illustration from the book earlier. Uh, they had the, uh, uh, Roald Robinson, he had limited resources. So he guarded them, he used them, but he kept them focused. They were sharp. Those 20 mile marches allowed his team to stay in sync and well rested. And as a result, they 
produced a winning outcome. Here's some of the most common constraints. I'll go through them quickly. They're not on the screen, but I just want to illustrate quickly to you some of the ones that can be. Sometimes it can be policy constraints. That that means tradition or um, the uh, assumptions. The way we do stuff, we've always done it this way, seems to work fine. Please test all your assumptions. Sometimes policies can be your biggest constraints. And sometimes lack lacking policies can be your biggest constraints. The next one I've already mentioned, which is global thinking versus local thinking. Local thinking is a huge constraint. It allows us, in fact, it forces us to start thinking in terms of tasks instead of results. There's a big difference. Uh, here's, a, here's a question for you. Are your job descriptions for your staff all results oriented or are they task oriented? Task oriented is ground zero thinking. Results oriented is global big picture thinking. Number three, managing tasks versus resource. Uh, again, this is a big one. A lot of times, and most of the time, I would say in our industry, we're, we're tempted. I know this was true for me for a long time, just managing all the little tasks and trying to keep up with them. When I started to step back and understand that, that I had to manage our resources, not our tasks, that's where the real treasure lies for, for a business that's winning in the, in, the, in the midst of chaos and confusion and all the other stuff. If we're doing a good job of managing the resources, the other stuff will fall into place and the last one is lack of focus on customer experience, which we already mentioned. How are you doing? Where are your constraints? So let's take a look at uh, how to overcome constraints. And this is big, it's a simple formula. We already mentioned most of them. Ruthlessly seek them out and isolate them. Talk about them, test them, and test your assumptions. Bring your team around you or, or a group of like-minded people. Help them, ask them. Ask your customers, by the way. Another <laughs> great resource, they'll tell you. Be prepared for the good and the bad. That's the emotional preparation. But doing it on the front end is a lot easier than trying to do it on the back end. Seek out your constraints. Number two, subordinate all your other activities toward resolving the constraints. Apply some resources to them. And number three, uh, invest those, as I said, invest the resources in order to obtain more capacity, regardless of what that constraint is. Quick story of one company recently uh, happened to be a home builder who was having a terrible time in their production end. And we're getting jobs in there and pushing the jobs into production quickly, too quickly, unfortunately, and ended up having a lot of chaos and confusion and a lot of unfavorable results are being produced. Long story short, they isolated the constraint to their framing crew. After a lot of debate and conversation, they figured out it was the framing crew and they were piling so much work on the front end Framing crew couldn't keep up. Schedules were falling behind. Profit was being compromised. Customer experience was not good and people were not happy. Uh, formula for failure, failure, clearly. They took the framing crew and made it the gateway for all of their job starts. What's your gateway? What's your least capable resource? What is it? Isolate it, figure it out. Predicate your other behaviors on getting that one thing resolved. And you'll find over time, very short amount of time actually, that things change really, really quickly. So with all that in mind, um, I wanna conclude today with a couple of thoughts. And here they are. First of all, there's a lot of stuff that's out of our control. We can't help it. We can't control it. Um, it's just, things like financial markets, uh, customer behaviors, earthquakes, global competition, weather, technology. Uh, really, when you think about it, almost everything tends to be somewhat out of our control. But we have influence and we have impact. And when you leverage your 20 mile march mentality, uh, that is the discipline with vision, daring and decisiveness, to do what you know you need to do in order to enable your business to grow above and beyond any kind of constraints or chaos or turbulence, and it will. Remember, in every downturn in the market, historically, there is a company, there's a group of companies that succeed and thrive. And that's a fact. You can go back historically and check it. There's always companies, a group of companies that make it. And the question becomes, why them? 
How can some companies thrive when others can't? And it goes right back to the 24,000 companies that Jim Collins researched in his book. Only seven of them came through. And that's because they practiced the disciplines that we're talking about today. Number one, being on purpose, setting goals and measuring your progress. That's being decisive. It's a discipline. Number two, the practice of having a marketplace focus, not an inward focus, an outward marketplace focus. Uh, it, it's a paradigm shift. I really wanna challenge you on this for this year and beyond. Focus on customer experience first and make sure everybody in your organization is also focused there. All of your systems, everything you do should be, should be designed to produce that one outcome. And in turn, you'll be assured that your profit will be protected. That's being visionary. It's looking outside of the box. And number three, manage constraints, not tasks. That's daring. Look at your business and find the weak link. And listen, when you do figure it out, you're gonna fix it. You're gonna apply resources to it. You're gonna isolate it and you'll fix it. And guess what? Tomorrow you'll find another weak link. And that'll be a perpetual exercise for you and your leadership team every single day to really gain traction in this uncertain market. And, and also, by the way, to some extent, to be able to even recession-proof your business and make it one of those group of businesses that always end up outlasting the downturns. They'll come, we know it, along with everything else tomorrow and the next day and the next day, there will be new problems. There'll be unthinkable problems. Uh, there'll be stuff we never even realized could have possibly happen, but that's the nature of the business. And I'll close with this. This is from A.G. Lafley in his book, uh, Playing to Win. And he said it this way, begin with the end in mind. Can you imagine winning without explicitly setting out to do so? Well, I just wanna say to all of you, I wish you the best for 2021. I hope your takeaway from this is great and that you've got some tools to go forward with. And I wish you the very best success uh, now and into the future. And thanks so much for being with me today. Debbie? Thanks, Fred. This has been really, um, I think everyone is spellbound. At least I know I am. Um, so it's been really interesting. Thank you. A lot of great information that you shared here. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions. So let's get right to those. Um, Arielle uh, is an independent designer and not selling items. She wants to know, how can I measure or calculate my profit? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And you must be able to measure and calculate your profit because there's some way in your unique business, whatever it happens to be, whether it's kitchen baths or design or remodel or any all of the above, you have to be able to uh, A, set your goal for profit and B, measure it. So profit for you probably is coming be your hourly rate in all likelihood. And your profit is basically gonna be what's left after your overhead. My guess, typically uh, the designer world, the overhead is relatively low. So you've got to know what your overhead is in order to be able to predict and measure your profit. That's a short answer to a, lot, a, a big question, but uh, that's probably the simplest way I can explain it briefly. Yes, Renee had put something in here to help uh, Ariel with her answer. And she said, money in minus the costs. There you have it. Great comment. That's basically what it comes down to. So you have to be able to take that goal uh, on a global level, a 12 month level, and then choke it down to an hourly level so you can measure it. And when you do so, it'll give you a lot of peace of mind, like I said earlier, uh, being ready and able to set that goal and know you can achieve it and measuring it along the way. Okay, and so Trisha would like to know, what are your top feedback questions uh, to ask a customer about their experience at the end of a project? I have a list uh, for a customer survey that's really simple. I suggest using four to six questions in a survey, no more, and one line for comments or feedback. And, uh, but the questions are very simple. Uh, can you rank, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. Can you rank your overall experience with XYZ kitchen and bath? Um, can you tell, uh, can you rank it? By the way, with the survey questions, I recommend that you have them ranked on a scale of one to five or one to 10, all of them. And so that over time you can compile those answers into an average and track it on your KPI sheet, by the way, it's a great way to go. Uh, other questions you can ask was, would be, uh, uh, please rate our uh, design um, sales process. 
Uh, another one would be please rate us on our communication. That's a huge one in our industry, huge. Um, and there, there are several others in there, but again, don't overwhelm people with a list of 20 questions. They won't respond. Four to six questions, make them the most important questions that point towards customer experience. Thanks, Fred. So Patty um, would like to know what tactic do you implement when you have an indecisive client who can't make a decision? That's a great question. And I get asked that question almost every single day around the country. The key to success here is set the expectations early, set them early. The customers aren't always right. And I say that because they, they, they don't know what right is. It's our job as professionals to educate them and make sure that we're crystal clear on what the expectations are for the experience that's coming up. For example, uh, we have a great process to make sure that we deliver the result. I'm role playing here. The results that you want, Mr. Client or Ms. Client, uh, and we're happy to do that, but I would like to explain there's a couple of responsibilities that are important for you to know in order for us to be able to succeed. Can I share those with you? Now, that comes down. One of those big customer responsibilities that comes in under that heading is the idea of what is your responsibility for making selections on time. And you can break it down into phases, put deadlines, but I'll tell you more and more professionals around the country in our industry are setting up the selections need to made, be made before start of work, boom, across the board. Anything else, the job's gonna be delayed. Okay, um, I have a couple of comments here. So um, Angela said, this has been terrific. Uh, you mentioned so many books and authors that uh, she has been reading for the last couple of years. So thank you. Great. And uh, Peggy says, so good. I will definitely have to listen to this good information again. So you've definitely made an impact here. <laughs> Good. That's great. I appreciate that a lot. I really appreciate the opportunity too, and I hope everybody has some great takeaway. And I, I'm not seeing any other questions here at the moment, Fred. So um, everyone is thanking you, and um, they they really love the information. I have a feeling that they probably want to watch this. Oh wait, here's here's one. Um, I'm not sure of the name here, but uh, it looks like Angie. She says, I have a client who signed the contract with general contractor, but seems to be dissatisfied with how part of the work went. What should I do? So I'm not sure where, what role Angie plays in all this. If she's the designer, for example, that's really difficult. It reflects on her if she's recommending that particular contractor, if she's not, that again, that comes back to expectations. You have to be crystal clear with your clients on the very, very front end. Uh, this is why I'm such a big advocate of pre-construction meetings with the client to redefine and re-emphasize the expectations. I want you to know, for example, in this case, that this particular contractor, I don't know them and I have really no control or influence with them. Uh, so it's gonna be up to you to make sure that they're right for your job and that they're reputable and reliable. Beyond that, I'll support you any way I can, but I just need you to know that up front. So honestly, beyond that, that's all you can do. Now, if you're re recommending that particular contractor and you end up with egg on your face, then obviously it's we're not using that contractor anymore. It's a done deal. And you gotta go back and do some collateral uh, damage or fix some collateral damage. Okay, thank you, uh, Fred. Um, someone is asking Carmela, she says, can we schedule you to speak to our team and our staff meeting? <laughs> Sure. So absolutely, absolutely. I, I speak to a lot of uh, staff and leadership teams around the country, and I'd be delighted to have that discussion. Okay. And then that KPI form that um, that you talked about earlier. I'm going to send everybody your contact information in my follow up email. Is that the best way? Or obviously, your information is here on the screen too. No, oh, that's fine. Yeah, send it out if you'd like. Debbie, I'll send you the spreadsheet, and you can just attach it to that email if you'd like to. Yeah, that would be great. That would be it's great. great. It's a great sheet. Now it's a template. Keep in mind everybody that's may be using it or have any use for it. It's a great sheet to use. It's simple, but you've got to fill in the blanks with the most important KPIs for your unique business. Okay, Fred. Yep, everybody's saying yes, please send it. <laughs> you got it. You and got they're, it. They're thanking us. So and um, so I think that's all we have for right now, Fred. Uh, I, I really one, one more one more thing uh, I'll I'll send as well, if, if it's of any value to you and the listening audience, is the customer survey questions. Uh, that's really important. You've got to be willing, ready, and able to hear the hard news from your clients to know if you're delivering the right service. So I'll send that survey question uh, document as well. And if you want to attach it, fine. If not, that's fine too. 
That sounds great, Fred. Thank you. And I, I want to thank, once again, thank you, Fred, for all this great information that you shared with our group today. And of course, to thank HEDIC for their generous sponsorship for our session. And uh, to all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it a lot. You're welcome.